inside of houses. Yeah, the particulate matter of the inside of houses and um, electrical generation uh, equipment. Mm, all that stuff. All those delicious, delicious heavy metals. All right. Um, talk again? I'm talking again. Fabulous. You see that the sign? It says applesauce. I'm just kidding. It says applause. Ooh, we should get an applause sign. That's true. Oh, I think we should have a buzzer in case one of us starts talking about a Burning Man story. Um, I've go, decided... Eh, eh, eh. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Can't do that here. <laughs> I think that's a good idea, and I think uh, calling the other podcast just the other podcast yeah. Yeah. Um, is probably the way to go, because... We should probably only mention the other podcast when you're doing a response to it. Or sure. I've well, got I think if I'm going to do a response to it, I want to do it all in one and have that on the other podcast, honestly. Not in touch with my emotions or my body, which... Uh, it's fair. This is, I guess it's the same thing, which is why I listen to music very differently than everyone else, because uh, music is a very emotional sort of medium. It's a way to convey emotions. Yeah, is and that I where find... you get your feelings out? No. No, I see music <laughs> as an attack on my sovereignty over how I feel. And if a song wants to make me feel sad, I'm going to say, fuck that song. I'm not going to feel sad. You don't control me. You're not my dad. And you know what? If you were my dad, I still wouldn't let you control me. So fuck off. That's pretty much my take on music. <laughs> it's my take on Pixar. Yeah. Well, movies, Who is more emotionally yeah, manipulative than yeah. Pixar? Oh, George Lucas. Ugh, uh, I don't think his movies are good enough to work, though. No, they're just so one-dimensional and sappy. Sure, it's the yeah, same but idea. I mean, that, so I, I'd say George Lucas is like Pixar I don't is know, the Rolling Stones. No, not the Rolling Stones. The Queen, the Queen of movies. The Queen to me is so just, just in your face, not subtle. Hey, we're gonna do this chord, and you're gonna feel this way, and everyone around you is gonna feel the same way, and you're gonna feel a sense of bonding with them, and mm-hmm. we're gonna make that happen. And it, it just, it feels like a betrayal. Uh, it feels like someone's attacking me. So you're it. not into camaraderie rock. <laughs> no, uh, I'm. I'm trying to. I'm getting better. You know, the last couple of years, I've definitely learned a lot more about how I process emotions and how other people do. So that's that's one thing. So today at work, it's me and another guy and uh, this older lady in the office, who uh, is usually playing a terrible internet radio station, but today piano man comes on Ooh, and yeah. she turns it up and she does not <laughs> sing along to it but she is humming along to it and i'm trying to write like a fucking researched essay or article like on medicare or medicaid and shit like that it and sounds like you're working very hard on medicare or <laughs> medicaid it's <laughs> sounds like you really nailed that one i don't entirely know the difference between them but i only have to write about one at a time yeah. um and like i i I've got like three days left at this job. I find it hard to care about anything going on, let alone like make a creative effort yeah. in, in writing a thing. Um, and she's just like, the song isn't getting louder, but it seems like it's getting louder to me right. with every <laughs> successive verse. It's just digging deeper into your head. Yeah. And then it ends and like some other god awful song comes on. But during that song, she decides that she's going to go to lunch and she asks if if I want to turn the music down. And I was like, or off! (laughs) (laughs) And then I realized that maybe that was a little bit uh, too adamant, but... I've been there. So we we jumped right into this. Um, We're recording. This is a podcast. It's called Something Else. It's uh, where D-Day, my co-host... I'm something else. And me, Zeno, which is spelled with an X, not a Z. It, It is a prefix... Not a philosopher. And D-Day is, uh, is spelled all lowercase and with a hyphen. The hyphen is important. <laughs> it's not a dash. It's a hyphen. Um, and, uh, yeah. This is where we take a topic and uh, dissect it and then dice it and then brulee it and then smush it down and grind it in a paste and then put it on a bagel. And then go off, off on a tangent for 10 minutes. And then forget that that was even the topic. <laughs> Um, hi friends. Hi. This is for you. Yeah, it is. So, have you so does your family do Christmas cards like a family Christmas card where like there's a couple paragraphs of like what's going on with the oh, family? Oh god, no. Um oh, mine neither. But this is how I'm kind of seeing this podcast mm-hmm. in my own brain. Ah, it's a uh, well, it's this a, is better than than a Christmas card. 
I think so. <laughs> they get to hear my uh, warm, cackling voice. Yeah. Our, um, our friends who, like, do things like wait in traffic, you're yeah. welcome. Yeah, well, it's a way for me to connect to them and say, hey, I'm doing okay. Here's what I'm going through. Uh, I'm not in jail anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not, you know, my house hasn't burned down. I got a little kitty cat named Spigot. I love her to death. She is uh, exactly my cat because she does not like emotion. She hates being touched. Every time I pick her up, <laughs> she puts a paw on my face and pushes me away as if to say subtly, no. Nice. So I can't be angry, but man, it breaks my heart every time she does it. <laughs> I was like, but that's why I got you, kitty cat. And then I was like, ooh, wow, that's how my parents must have felt. Uh-huh. Oh, man, I need to send them a card. Better medicate that cat. <laughs> Um, so today's topic, uh, in general is music. Um, I know it's broad, it's overly broad. I'm looking forward to learning things about the industrial music. Well, we'll get to the Can industrial music. Can we talk music. about Babyland? Oh, absolutely. Great. Oh, definitely. D- yeah. That is, uh, I'd call it post-industrial, but yeah, sure. I but don't po- parse music <laughs> genres that I, well. I know. Um, I, the way I deal with music is I sit and I think about it. Because uh, music, I refuse to let it affect my body and thus uh, not affect my emotions. So I only let it affect my mind. So I have to think about it. And <laughs> You play chess with music. I do. <laughs> and a lot of the people who are coming to this podcast because they know of me through uh, the other thing mm-hmm. that we've done. We can say Burning Man, through right? The, <laughs> through the general uh, aura that, and the, legend. The big party of, in the desert. You know. <laughs> uh, I... I DJ Zeno used to be a really big deal at Burning Man, guys. No, it's never a big deal. It was only a big deal to a few people, and that's all I need, which is why I encourage you to not subscribe to this podcast <laughs> at all. Don't rate us. I don't care. Well, you should rate us because I really do want to read your, your ratings, but like, or well, send review us, an email. us. Don't rate us. Send us an email. That's fine. Send us an oh, it, email. Oh, right. I so, have Proton Mail now. That's great. I actually I signed us up for Gmail, but we could switch it over to Proton. Oh well, I have Proton Mail for a completely different sort of like cacophonous oh, thing that I've it. stumbled into. Yeah. Um, no, Proton Mail is great. Everyone should do it. Uh, I I do want to do a computer security and privacy uh, episode, maybe a, a two parter because it's a big subject. And Proton Mail is great. Y'all should use it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pretty impressed with with it so far. Um, yeah, for an email solution. That's encrypted. Um, it seems pretty good. Mm-hmm. I it, it's the first thing that somebody has pointed me to in a while that doesn't just seem like a redundancy for Keybase or Signal. Oh, uh, that cat's gonna keep uh, rocketing itself at your crotch. Okay, you call that a cat? A cat? That's that's fine. That's not, that's not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> it was coming after my cock. I don't know. It just got smushed together. Um, so we do have an email address. Uh, we do have a Patreon, although that Patreon is not live. It is yet to be... But maybe it'll be live when Episode 2 comes That's out. That's what I'm saying. Hey, folks, this is Episode 2 yes. of Something Else with Zeno and D-Day. And our email address, if you want to just send us a missive, you know, whatever, is something else cast at Gmail. No spaces, no dashes. And uh, Patreon is going to be uh, something else at Patreon. You shouldn't give us money. I'm taking a... a Tip from Daniel O'Brien right there and saying you should not give us money. Uh, <laughs> when you start off doing a podcast, it feels really weird to ask people to give you money because you haven't sunk uh, thousands upon thousands of hours into it yet. But uh, once we, we put some meat on on this podcast, it'll be like, yeah, no, 50 bucks a month would be nice for all the time that we put in. Oh, totally. This. I mean, I, I've signed up for the hosting and, and the URL. Yeah, so not 50 that's... bucks from each of you a month. Like, 50 bucks total mm-hmm. would be really gratifying um, from all of you, our really deliciously Devoted. Sexy our devoted, fans. awesome. I'm starting out with deliciously sexy. Like, I'll yeah. try to get less creepy from here. That's fine. <laughs> So uh, last time we did have a homework, which was to consider spending ten dollars on uh, giving money directly to a artist or some sort of content producer that you cared about. Uh, because we're actually recording a couple of these before we're releasing them, I have not had a chance to read your homework yet. But I do want to read what you think about that. Um, I will. I promise 
I will not ask you to spend any more money on any more homeworks. <laughs> I felt bad when I did it initially, but then I felt not so bad because it's only 10 bucks. I and really wasn't intending on, on doing it, but uh, I got guilted into it. Oh, nice. Um, uh, what, what did you consider? You don't have to say what you did. But oh, I, I will. I will say exactly what I did. Um, I I read and I have been reading a political blog called Wonkette. Yeah. For like the better part of the past fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's run by uh, a political reporter editor whose name is Rebecca Shankoff, um, <laughs> or or something of that sort. And every once in a while, she writes an article where the headline is like clickbait and then you click on it and it's a giving ask. And uh, as I had this homework and as I have literally read thousands of their brilliant snarky political articles over the years, it really seemed like it was the time to finally buck up and give them some money. Yeah. And you don't have to do it as a recurring payment, although that really does help them as far as their finances. But uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, a couple dollars here and there. I really think that the, the bane of the internet right now is advertisement because advertisement leads to a business model of seeking engagement and platforms like Facebook and Twitter trying to maximize the time that you spend on their site so that you see the advertisements and it, it the the business model is to track you so that they can advertise to you better and we can cut all of that out and make the internet a much better place if we have direct payments to the people that create the things that make the internet awesome so we can get rid of all these shitty companies and so i don't have to feel bad about having ad blockers and stealing stuff (laughs) because i i am a hypocrite i do i download a lot of things illegally but that's because you know if i could pay the coen brothers directly for Mm -hmm. their movie i would totally do that and i do go to movie theaters but on a certain level i'm just gonna fucking steal shit (laughs) I asked David Cross on Twitter when his new comedy album came out. He wasn't selling it through his site. You had to go to other sites to get it. And mm-hmm. I just tweeted at him. I was like, dude, can I just give you $15 yeah. and you give me a download code for this? Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't that great. Yeah. This, this one was a little well, bit disappointing. But, but you like, know what? I've, You're paying for the whole, the, all of this stuff before, body too. Of work. Yeah, yeah the, the, the whole shebang. Um, I think that's true about the advertising. I think that's a very... Um, timely very specific problem yeah with advertising and i think it's gonna take a while to chip away at that but i think the more people that do it i think the better our all of our lives are gonna be uh absolutely but just just in general when you're thinking about uh paying for media with commercials um i i didn't become an ad man um, I was going to. I have a degree. Oof. My undergraduate degree is in marketing and public relations. I'm sorry. Um, it's fine. Um, it <laughs> it was a waste of money. Um, I'm not sure it was a waste of time. But uh, it, it, it taught me some things about how frames are used mm-hmm. and, and how you are pointed by a content cr- creator at their content from a specific angle. And what you don't want is somebody who works in advertising or marketing to have input on that creative decision. Oh, yeah. Those are, by and large, not the sort of creative people that you want to have input into the creative product that you're interested in. So if you can bypass uh, those suit-wearing douchebags, mm. I'm going to say it. Oh. You know what? I bet Hot they take. all have fucking Hot French take. cuffs. On their goddamn beer, 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 beer. We don't have an air horn. The second the I yet. see an awesome dress shirt that I'm like, ooh, I could wear that to work for my... Uh, it's still a white collar job, but like I do weird nonprofit shit. Um, but when I see uh, a dress shirt at the thrift store that I really, really want because it's got a pretty cool uh, pattern on it, and I find out that it's got fresh cuffs, hmm. it's like, ugh. Oh, I have some cufflinks with X on them that a girlfriend got for me. I have cufflinks too, but I only have like one fancy shirt. Um, and this time, the cat did not turn off the recording. So that's oh, dude, good. my cat knows exactly what button to push. Mm-hmm. My cat will hit the caps lock and the power button. Just those are the only buttons she goes for. She will turn off my computer in a heartbeat. I, it's I'm proud of her in a certain <laughs> sense. I'm like, yeah, fuck the system. You're right. And right now, I'm the system to you. So... Yeah, get it, cat. For some reason, Dr. Worm is really interested in what I'm doing when I'm masturbating. 
have not had that problem yet. Yeah, it's not cool to have like a f- fleshy cat like come up and look at your dick when your dick is out. I don't so like Professor it. Worm is a hairless cat. Uh, I'm creeped the fuck out by it. It is. And that's why I'm saying it instead of he, because uh, I am othering it. That's, uh, that's fuck fine. Fuck that thing. It's um, it gross. actually doesn't have a teaching credential. It is just a doctor. <laughs> I've got a doctor's degree in science. <sighs> Unfortunately, like, I'm not one to buy costumes for my pets, and I'm still not one to buy costumes for my pets because there isn't a good-looking doc- doctor's costume for my hairless cat. The only one there is looks like an apron. <laughs> it's like an apron attached to a scrunchie you're supposed to cram around its neck. He needs a goddamn coat. Yeah, so this has been Cat Update. This is the uh, the initial after chit-chat uh, segment of the podcast. We're going to talk about our cats. Um, and D-Day has a somewhat larger uh, pseudo-hairless cat that I just consider a cat. It's three years old. It's cute. I've never met it. But uh, I pretty much, like, I have spigot. Mm-hmm. And you have your three-year-old cat with the toys outside. I was really hoping that Daddy Issues was going to be here today because I was going to uh, drop the question like 90 minutes into us recording of oh, when no. the two you were having a kid. Oh, fuck um, you. I know. <laughs> it was going to be great. Uh, talking about it is all right. But okay, the true is... experience of, oh, he will go right the fuck on your shoulder, hang out there for a while, and then start licking your hair. <laughs> okay. Well, it's hard. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to move the mic now. Hard, cat on my soldier, soldier uh, licking my head. This is this is the thing that I go through to bring you this quality mm-hmm. audio. Yeah, so they you know should, is, we should go to our Patreon. Something this. else. This is, this is exactly the sort of face that. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Uh, we're, we're doing uh, multimedia. Is that what the kids are doing with the? Oh, sure. The I still meets? don't want my face really associated. Um, I've I've tried really hard to not have my face mm. out there. Oh, much. it's fine. I've got Photoshop. No, I know. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Um, yeah, I've been pretty good. I, about I can keeping... replace your Jesus face with Doctor Worm's face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're gonna you're gonna want to get him off there before he starts biting your ear. Yeah. All right. All right, Doctor Worm. Yeah. So the cat Zeno was referencing before is my kid, um, my little boy, Code Adam. I knew that. Code Adam is the best playa name you can give a kid. It was going to be arson. Arson's a really bad idea. Yeah, not on the radio. Uh, not just in general. Like you can't be calling your kid a felony because oh when your kid uh, commits that felony, it's your fault. Um. I mean, I can call him Code Adam, and if he gets lost, he's going to get lost anyway. I had a friend that brought her 13-year-old kid out there who was legitimately ADHD and had Ritalin, and he just she just let him wander around. He mm-hmm. traded his drugs for fun and made a lot of friends. It was actually kind of beautiful. Anyway, today's topic is music. Like the music that they play all the time at the burn. Yes. So a lot of people met me uh, as my DJ persona, and my DJ persona is DJ Salinger. Wow, I didn't know that. Yep. I was all prepared to hate whatever you said, but I... Uh-huh. I kind of win people over with <sighs> With the, chagrin, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't yep. hate yep. that. Yep, I got some points. Oh, man. <clears throat> Like that and, annoys me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that is that is essentially what yeah, my what's DJ the German does. word for the feeling of when you expect to be upset by somebody's idea, but you begrudgingly are not. It's like the opposite of Schadenfreude. I don't know. Non Schadenfreude. Yeah. The, the, some know. sort of cousin to Schadenfreude. Mm-hmm. Like Schadenfreude disappointment. Yeah. So I found it, I don't interact with people all that well in like big party situations. I feel overwhelmed. Uh, I don't get like social cues very well. So it's actually super simple for me to DJ because then I have a, a task at the party. And then I bartend. Yeah, no, that works. I do that too. And so whenever you're done with a conversation, you can be like, oh, I got to go do this thing and cut the conversation mm-hmm. off and that person doesn't feel slighted. Also, if someone is awesome and they're like, oh my God, what is this song? I can sit there and dish about that song for like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then if the music stops, I don't care because it's that's not really what I'm doing. Um, and so I had a policy of I would never play the same genre back to back. I would go from punk to country to hip hop to oldies. 
to like noise to diamond de gloss like opera um to commercials like fake commercials and just keep everyone off balance which turns out most people don't want to do no people want to be uh very very balanced when they're listening to a dj set right which is and and i've had several people come up to me and say um could you just play something to make me dance to which i'd reply um this is burning man dance motherfucker (laughs) go throw a rock (laughs) and follow it you'll find something to dance to not sure why you came into the saloon expecting to get anything that you wanted right and and also if you want to to dance that much you'll find a way to dance to what i'm playing Mm -hmm. like if if you want to listen to bob wilson dance you can do it and um i don't know if i told no okay no no burning man stories anyway the reason I do that is because, you know, I don't have this emotional connection to music that a lot of other people have, and I don't respect dancing at all. I think it's weird and performative and uh, kind of a – it seems like lying. <laughs> this is like – You're not going to fuck like that. Right. And <laughs> I've always been the one that's, like, sitting in the corner watching people do this weird performance, mm-hmm. and it's, I don't get it. So – I like to sit and, you know, think about music like I mentioned, and I have a theory about that, which is, and bear with me, so there's a scale between absolutely no information and uh, absolutely useless information, and this is because I'm a computer programmer. So, no information or very little would be like 0101 repeated forever. That's basically a metronome. It's Mm. tick, tick. On off, on off, on off, on off. And you need that sort of reliability if you're going to anticipate what's going to happen and dance to music. Mm -hmm. Uh, Information is where you get, you know, zero, one repeated 10 times, but then all of a sudden you get zero, zero, one, one. Mm -hmm. That's information. And that's something that your brain latches onto because it's different than the pattern and that makes it important. So, like, if you're in the jungle as a human brain and everything looks like leaves, but all of a sudden something looks like a tiger. You're going to pay attention to that tiger mm-hmm. because it breaks the pattern of leaves. Bear with me. <laughs> I'm so less than fascinated, but still interested. Okay, that's you, mm, I'm gonna <laughs> fucking fascinate you. <laughs> no, I was that's going to let you keep talking. I mean, no, no, you're good. You constantly prompting me <laughs> to let you keep talking. Hey, hey, give me permission. <laughs> you're just used to being here and being so drunk. You have to keep telling me to let you keep talking. Yeah, maybe. Well, no, I think that's not just here. I think that's just in my life. That's fair. <clears throat> so, in computer theory and like information theory, basically random noise is completely filled with information because you cannot predict any of it. So you have to consistently watch it for new information. So I think music is a happy balance between a metronome and white noise. So you'll have a structure, but you can change within that structure to keep people's attention, but there's still uh, a scaffolding they can hold on to. Mm-hmm. I was always interested in seeing what happens if you tear more of that scaffolding away. And, you know, there's been, you know, 3,000 years of developed Western science about what music is as far as, you know, the uh, 12-tone octave and, uh, you know, Timings in like four four or six four or nine three or whatever. We're so ingrained in that, like uh, yeah. the way that Eastern music works is mm-hmm. so different. It, it's so different, and it is so like immediately dissonant and like almost offensive to your ear because you just have no idea how to process mm-hmm. their concept of like octaves with semitones. Yeah, which fascinates me. Because I'm not looking for something that is the same all the time. That's why I find pop music insufferable. I know that there's a bridge coming. I know that the verse is going to do this. I know the chorus is going to come back to the same thing. And it's just boring to me. Where a lot of people get comfort and solace that they can sing along with it with a large group of people. Which goes back to the root of my name, which is Zeno. I just don't feel okay with other people. I want to watch them and see what they're doing and figure it out. And I've just, so I have a different relation to music and I try to keep people on their toes and I've developed sort of a fan base, uh, in those parties 
at the event where like some people will be like, oh, are you DJing tonight? I will be there. And they will drop acid and sit on a bench in the corner and just kind of listen to what I mm-hmm. do. And I had uh, managers, 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 manager uh, come up to me because I was DJing at his theme camp. And they had made a huge room for a dance floor. And he's like, um, hey, I like what you're doing, but uh, we have this huge dance floor and no one's using it. And I was like, oh, I can just take my laptop and go. That's cool. No, I get it. This is your space. And I, don't, I don't really want to fuck with it. He's like, no, wait, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. Uh, no, I'm just saying, like, you know, maybe, like, play something a little more danceable. And I'm like, oh, that's not what I do. I can uh, – I'll go home. That's fine. But, you know, people ask for this. And he's like, well, I just – I don't think people are enjoying it. And then this weird-ass bike punk dude in a jean vest and fucked up hair, wasted as fuck, just spun around and went, woohoo across the dance floor and just ran into some posts. And I'm like, okay, I'm DJing for that guy right now. Because you know what? No one DJs for that guy. No one DJs for the people that listen to music the way that I do. Mm-hmm. Everyone DJs for this weird crowd response, which is like, I can see everyone dancing, and that's validating of what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I don't need that validation. I know that there are people, and they've actually come up to me and told me that they were in their tents and in their bunks, laying in their bed, listening, and enjoying the fuck out of it. But because there's no visual like immediate feedback that, Hey, I like this. I don't care. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I do that. And so one of the things I want to do with this podcast, maybe at the end, uh, suggest or talk about a band or an album or something Mm -hmm. that, you know, piques my interest. And so this is kind of the, the foray into explaining what tickles my fancy and the things that I might want to bring to the table. I mean, my, big vague musical excitement is that uh somehow some way they're releasing a new harry nielsen album i don't know who that is uh he's the guy who wrote uh lime and the coconut oh um, wow he was like the fifth beetle um, oh okay he wrote one of my favorite songs which is think about your troubles mm. um i just remember the muppet show doing lime and the coconut mm-hmm. that was um oh he impactful. was he was an amazing really weird incredibly talented uh, musician and songwriter Mm -hmm. um and i mean he wrote uh one is the loneliest number Mm -hmm. um and uh me and my arrow um you're breaking my heart Mm -hmm. tearing it apart so fuck you um just like a precursor to zappa not as yeah. virtuoso as zappa but definitely realized like wait a minute you can do some weird stuff uh-huh mm-hmm. um i wish uh i wish i knew if he ever had the chance to hang out with the dead milkman um mm-hmm. i think that would have mm-hmm. been great <laughs> yeah the dead Mil- uh, one of the only songs that i will sing in karaoke is a uh, punk rock girl mm. it's a good song. that or the laverne and shirley theme song those are the only nice. two songs that i will sing and I, I, do, usually... I do want to mention that mm-hmm. we, we do have a sponsor uh, this week. Is I've been emailing them back and forth. Uh, just, they haven't sent me some direct ad copy, um, but it's uh, it's Little Joe's uh, Harry Karaoke Bar. It's in downtown San Francisco mm-hmm. on uh, 6th and Goff. And uh, it's it's a neat idea. It's a Harry Karaoke Bar. It's a bar where you and your friends can go. You can sing, you know, whatever whatever song you want. Um, but, uh, you know, you've been to a karaoke bar, right? Oh, I'm real good at karaoke. Yeah, so you're good, but you've heard people that are bad, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't you want them to just die? Yes. Because we don't need that. We don't need someone getting on stage and poisoning our ears, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. destroying our favorite beloved songs. Destroying the milieu that they're in, even. Right. And, you know, sometimes I can leave that bar, and uh, three days later, I'm still hearing that awful rendition. Mm-hmm. So uh, the deal with the Harry Karaoke Bar is that if you suck, the crowd votes you out, you have to eviscerate yourself. And they provide the sword. So oh, it's, well, yeah, because it's, it's you're a not going to be able to sharpen the sword right. yourself. It's a win-win all around. Uh, you know, your friends uh, get to listen to awesome music, or they get to see uh, just a ritual suicide mm-hmm. and uh, bloodbath on stage. Uh, they're they're very good. They put plastic down. Uh, they got 
that they have a guy that mops that up in like 20 seconds flat for the next performer. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have a very, very responsible and uh, courteous burial service. Uh, they'll, they'll put them in a coffin right in the back and you can drive them home. So uh, you should check out that uh, the Harry Karaoke Bar. It's uh, Sixth and Goff downtown San Francisco. Um, they're giving us a lot of money, so check it out. I was there one day, and uh, like the mop guy didn't show up, and they just had one of those like little robotic round moppers oh, going back and forth on oh, the like stage. the Roomba. Oh. The, yeah, the yeah, blood the little Roomba. Roomba mop. Oh, it was just people in America don't know about the blood Roomba yet. It, it was it's just like life, painting the stage. Well, it's a lifesaver. For the housekeeping, it's not a lifesaver. Literally, mm-hmm. I mean, they, yeah, no, yeah, they're you're dead. dead. They're dead. Yeah, you're dead. But uh, no, they 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 get that blood right up. Mm-hmm. Those little robots. I mean, they're like sixty bucks. It takes a little while. You know, they bump into walls, but you know, they'll they'll get it eventually. Oh, the, no, the new ones. They got like radar. Yeah. They got lidar. They got uh, infrared microphones. They, oh yeah, no, they've got the whole sensory array. They connect to your Wi-Fi. Like they map your house. They send that map somewhere else. Well, I'm sure it's useful. <clears throat> so, so i want to talk about like how william gibson got it so right so long ago yeah <laughs> which book <laughs> uh like the first 20 yeah <laughs> we're we're really guy. barreling toward that he was a uh, neuromancer crowd right? in san francisco yeah he didn't do snow crash though right no that's uh the guy who did that's neil stevenson yeah um and Snow Crush was good. It was but, good. It's not prescient. Uh, it's not prescient. Um, but it's a little it, bit. I mean, it does definitely have uh, the corporate nation state. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not like that hasn't been something that's existed for the past three hundred years. It's also we got just the don't weird really people out in the it. water, which like Peter Thiel is kind of doing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's uh, aquasteading, something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, my lady friend through her previous work knows some of the people who are like at the forefront of that weird libertarian movement. Mm. Um and it's it's as rich as it's dumb. I I would keep a good connection to those people just to see what happens. Dude, we're we're not going to be lucky enough to get to the coast and No, that's fine. I just Oh, oh, you mean the drownings? <laughs> Well, just, you know, hey, guys, what's going on? I'm on your side. How about you tell me everything? (laughs) Well, I mean, they still haven't been able to convince world governments that just because they built the largest raft anyone's ever built that, like, they're not sovereign. Right. (laughs) Um, So music. Yeah. So have you ever heard of the Futurist Manifesto? No. So this guy Luigi Rosolo, definitely no. Oh, uh, so this is it's an interesting and troubling history of the music that I really like. Uh so 1913, it's like right before World War 1 or right after? Wait, before. 13? Right before. Yeah, yeah, so it started in 14 or 15, right? And went until 19 or 21. Yeah. Yeah. So I know what happened during it. I just don't know dates. Well, it's, it's hard because the futurists, they were basically like, we now have mechanization. Uh, we have ears that are conditioned to an industrial environment. Mm-hmm. And so our music should reflect that. So they made these things called the intonomori, which are these big boxes with cranks. And they had names like bangers, clackers, droners, groaners. And they would have uh, shows where people would go expecting, you know, music. Mm -hmm. And they'd get on stage and just try to, like, recreate the sounds of a battlefield through, like, these big machines. And they also, like, took shoe polish and spiked their hair up all black and pointy. They were the original punks. (laughs) People had riots at these shows. Dude, I found out that, like, people had riots, like, back in Mozart's day when somebody would play an aria, but it was all Oh, the right of spring. Yeah. Yeah. The Red Spring, like, people just tore shit up. Like, the, like <laughs> burned they burned down. shit in the yeah. street because, like, there were too many dissonant chords mm-hmm. in this, like, three-hour-long opera that mm-hmm. they heard. Yeah, it's part of my overall world theory that, like, there's always been punk rock. Mm-hmm. It's just that 
you know, people in the 1400s didn't have recording devices. Mm-hmm. And they would just call them, oh, there's some people got possessed by Satan and ran around and got crazy. And then we executed them. Cause Boy, they sure are <laughs> fucking and screaming in the woods. Better yeah. burn them. <laughs> so there's always kind of been this this part of culture, and there always will be this going to be like, I see what you're doing. I see the structure. And, you know, you can apply that to our Western theory of music mm-hmm. and say that structure needs to get torn down and I want to see what else I can do. And that's kind of what the futurists did. Unfortunately, they got a little fascisty. Oh, they do. It's, I mean, if you just listen to what they say, they're like, yeah, war and machines and efficiency, and bombs. And we can make it beautiful with these right. mechanical and this boxes. Is, and this is beautiful. <laughs> so after World War II, um, it started in Italy, but it had a few mm-hmm. proponents in oh. Russia and some other places. They had crossovers with some of the Dada art and Surrealist and Cubism. They're were, they were very much like, if not equal, like very close to equal to mm-hmm. those art movements. But uh, no one talks about them anymore because the fascists really loved them. And so after World War II, they kind of destroyed uh, all it's the like recordings. like brutalist and all architecture. The... Yeah. So that's kind of like the the first recording or like the first like movement for industrial Mm -hmm. and there's definitely been some people that could get away with that sort of thing um namely like john cage or uh, ira glass's cousin um philip glass but those people had to get their bona fides they had to like prove they were good at telling a whole room full of musicians what to do and when to do it Mm -hmm. and then they could get weird yeah so well, it's like Picasso. If you see his early work, like the man was a brilliantly skilled yeah. artist or Duchamp. and painter. Like I love Duchamp. Yeah. He was fucking amazing. Yeah. And you have to prove to the establishment that I can do what you do mm-hmm. at least as well as you can do it. And then But turn look it on at all head. of these fucking thoughts yeah. I have, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> and so part of industrial, I think is so uh, mid to late seventies, they kind of picked this idea up that never really went away, but there's several people that picked that up and industrial and noise really used a lot of those ideas. And so throbbing gristle came up with the idea of industrial music. They started industrial records for industrial people. That was their tagline. And they started off as an art group in England. The lead singer is the first person to get exiled from England in 150 years, literally got exiled. Um, you should look him up. His name is Genesis P. Orge. Um, hit, uh, his it's they's, uh, they're one of my heroes. Uh, I the, prefer the Schmer. Living. Most people don't. He he and his lady friend got plastic surgery to become one. They got oh. plastic surgery to look like one another. So he got tits. And I don't know if I've heard about them or mm-hmm. if I just know of people that have done that. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's real familiar. Yeah, it's weird. They started off as a performance art group and then their funding got cut. So they started a band called Throbbing Gristle. Mm-hmm. Um, the other, like, big proponent. So were they based on the Invisibles, or were the Invisibles based on that? I don't know who the Invisibles is. Then never mind. Okay. Well, should I look it up? We can no. pause. Well, it's not Let's a thing to some... talk about now. Okay. No, I'll <laughs> talk about obscure comics from the late 80s later. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not into comics. So you can educate <laughs> me about comics sometime. How about that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I do, I... I find that some comics do give me a lot of value it's just i don't know which ones and i'm not willing to invest the time to figure out which Uh, ones are good there's there's tens of thousands and there's probably only like there there's still comics even though some of them are bound together and called graphic novels like comic is an art form and there are probably like 10 to 18 comics that like everybody should probably really read mm-hmm. just to see what that entire art form is capable of. Yeah. Well, I heard... And The Invisibles is comics version of Illuminatus. Gotcha. Oh, I love The Illuminatus. It's it, it's as close to a visual version of that that you will ever get. Mm. It, it's So I hate when people that are into graphic novels and mm-hmm. comics are like, oh, if you have to read one thing, read The Watchmen. Because no, <laughs> the Watchman draws on a lot of references, yes, and tropes. Mm-hmm. And if you just watch it, you're like, ah, this is garbage. These are assholes. Like, uh, I mean, also it 
It is seminal. I do love the Watchmen. I love it too. I have but you have to all have of, the background for I, I it have to understand what they're like making a critique of. But still, like it's it's not as effective. To, it, it's lazy to point people at that now. Yeah, because comics were a much different thing before Alan Moore made the people behind superheroes actual people with problems. Right. Yeah. And. And there's a lot of that ultra violence because of broken people with superpowers now. Yeah. Oh God, is he a Joker? Yes. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't hate it. I don't think there's anything to hate. I think um, it, I think it's super simple. Um, mm-hmm. it, there's no nuance. There's no like undercurrent. There's nothing to pick apart. It says, "Hey, I'm going to tell you this guy's sad. Check it out. This mm-hmm. guy's sad. Oh, hey." I told you this guy said, which, you know, if you're going to a mass market audience, that's fine, I guess. But I mean, they could have done a, a little bit more heavy lifting on just, I don't know, something in the background. Just, I don't know, nuance. Something. It was, it, stylistically, it was very mid 70s to early 80s. But yeah, it was just, it was a patina New York that I think that they were, that they were. Like, it, it, it was slow for reasons why it shouldn't have had to be slow, because, like, the frame isn't showing me anything. Sure. Um, it was cruel just to pile on this character. Yeah. Um, some of it was fantasy, but some of it wasn't fantasy. And I could, like, I knew that the relationship with the woman in his building wasn't a real relationship. Yeah. But Todd Phillips, as a director, does not give you any inkling throughout the entire movie what is and what isn't his fantasy exactly and, and yeah if you're gonna have an unreliable narrator like you need some sort of delineation or some sort of hook where people can tell where this thing is real this is part of the main character's fantasy mm-hmm. you don't have to but you know if you don't do that then you're just left with i don't know were all those riots really happening I were, were people actually burning down the city was he actually lifted up and cheered? Or was that part of his fantasy, too? Oh, like, the whole could, thing could have been a fantasy, right. for all we know. And, like, the very last um, scene, he didn't need that. He didn't need someone interviewing him and then walking away with, like, blood on his shoes. What, did he kill her? Okay, and then he runs away from someone else dressed the same way as him? This is the pointless... That's the last fucking thing. People are going to walk away from your movie looking at that thing, and they're like, what just happened? Uh, it anyway. reminds me of Inception, which... I also didn't care enough about to hate, except for the fact that uh, um, the director, who the fuck is it? Um, oh, he's good. Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's a Chris. He's Chris, a, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, um, yeah. he is an incredibly skilled filmmaker. Mm. Um, but dude, you don't land a movie on a question mark. Mm-hmm. without giving <clears throat> any indication in the text prior to that, even if it's in the first couple minutes or somewhere in there, mm. what is actually happening. Like, his yeah. answer of, like, maybe maybe he's asleep, maybe he's not right. asleep. Even I don't know. Dude, yeah. that's, that's not fucking it's, art, then. It's really handy <laughs> It's really handy at the end to have a character make a decision that may suck mm-hmm. or maybe great and troubling. Yeah, you're hedging your bets then. Like you've right. well, you've it's, dulled your. It's point. part of this, this mass audience appeal. Anyway, wait, mm-hmm. we're talking about music. Uh, this, we're wait, talking about this a, is a lot of things. different goddamn. Po- Let's talk about movies some other time. <laughs> <laughs> I have some deep seated some some movie things that I really want to talk about and a homework related to it. But we're talking. We've only just started talking about industrial music. Well, so Einstein and Day Neubauten is the other. A uh, band outside of Throbbing Gristle, I think, were really the progenitors of industrial music. Mm-hmm. Eins Zende Neubauten is a German band that uh, their name means roughly uh, destroying new architecture. <laughs> oh, no. They came up in Germany. There's a thing called new architecture, which is all of the buildings that were built after World War II. Mm-hmm. So all of the new progress. It's destroy the new progress, basically. <laughs> Doesn't sound fascist to me. Um, yes, <laughs> they are not. They are just kind of brutal. They're in sen- So let's see. They're one of the bands that epitomized uh, very strange 
um, timing signature. Like they did a five nine, uh huh. Which, if you're if you know anything about music, if you have to count five nine in your head, uh, that'll drive you crazy. Mm-hmm. Four four. It's very easy. One two three four five nine. <laughs> Counting five, but over nine measures is insane. Yeah, because they don't add up for a while. Mm-hmm. Um. And they would rehearse in all of these buildings that had been like bombed out and destroyed and evacuated, and would use like jet engines and uh, jackhammers. One of their shows, they played the last show at this huge music hall that was going to get demolished, and they just drove jackhammers through the stage during oh, the show. God, that's so fucking cool. Um, <laughs> if you get a chance, uh, you should really see Des- uh, Desolation Center. Uh huh. It's about it's proto Burning Man. Right. It's before Burning Man. It's like 81 to 83 or 85. And it's these people that just like took a bunch of weird punk weirdos out to the desert and had weird shows. They had Sonic Youth. Mm-hmm. They had Einstein de Neubauten. They had SRL, Survival Research Laboratories. Um, they had Boyd Rice. Uh, and some like local hardcore uh, punk bands. You should check out the movie. It's absolutely amazing. And... Uh, and it, now we're talking about movies again. It it presents the lie that Burning Man is. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now we're talking um, about I'm, Burning Man and movies. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that like nobody did a temporary autonomous zone before Larry came up with a temporary right, right. autonomous zone. Somehow, like decades <laughs> after hockey. Yeah, no. Uh, Chicken John went on these uh, parties and was like, "I should do something like that." <laughs> okay, so like the or official Law, stance yeah. of. Of this podcast and the other podcast is that Chicken John can go fuck himself. I'm sorry, I meant John Law. <laughs> That's fine. I like. They're John both Law, Johns, but yeah. Chicken John can. Chicken John is a self-aggrandizing little. Yeah, he's whatever. Never met him. He's a fucking booger. Okay. So, in in my theory about this, so you have like a bunch of people just like destroying the concept of music as is told in school. The four four measures the. The chords and whatnot. You get punk rock, which is just anyone can do it. So you have kind of an amateurism that I love. Um, amateurism is one of the reasons I loved going to work for Burning Man. Mm-hmm. It's not volunteerism. It's amateurism. It's saying, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I love that attitude towards music and filmmaking and culture in general. And you have people that want to make oral soundscapes. Uh-oh. You got it? Yeah. in there? All right. Oh, when, when the screen goes off, I just move the mouse now, and I don't click anything, and it seems to work. Oh, did you click it last time? Maybe. Is that the thing? Okay. All right. So, you have a mixture of amateurism and just a dismissive attitude towards 2,000 years of uh, study about what sound is, and you can get into some really weird headspaces. So, my definition of music is intentional sound, and that can be atonal, tonal, it can be, you know... Sunshine and Lollipops from Leslie Gore, which I love. I try to start every DJ set with that song. Mm -hmm. Or a theme from A Summer Place by Percy Faith, uh, just to lull people into a Mm -hmm. nice, calm mood and then just destroy that mood. So you can do all these things. I'll bring it to one of my favorite bands, which is Autocra. And I think they really go from the metronome concept of something that's very repetitive and that a lot of people would call trance or, Mm -hmm. you know, house or whatever. It's something that's very repetitive and you can kind of lose yourself and turn your brain off and Mm -hmm. listen to this repetition and know that that repetition is going to be there. It's almost like a, like a safety blanket. Right. It's, it's a, it's a way to go into a place where, you know, it's all going to be the same and you, you, are not going to be faced with anything different or new, which is comforting. And I think that goes to human nature. If you're, if you feel safe, you want to go explore and, and get more information. So that's more playful. Mm -hmm. And that goes to more chaotic music. But if you're in distress, you kind of want to like go back home to something safe. Right. And there's a balance between those. And I've always not wanted to be safe. I always want to go to the crazy so Autocra in their EP uh, Bass Cadet, and I'll make a playlist to illustrate all mm-hmm. these, and I'll try to uh, put songs in that playlist that will you know touch on all the things that I've mentioned. Bass Cadet is just it's just 
repetition. It's very boring. It's them kind of feeling their oats. They're like they're figuring it out. They're they're programming their their instruments. Um, and then LP five, I think, is the quintessential Autocra album. It's fucking amazing. Uh, the entire album, I think, is probably my favorite album. It really does skirt the line between chaos and order. And then they descend into Confield, which is they learned how to write their own music programs in the C programming language. Mm -hmm. And they'd have a lot of random inputs. So their shows would be half their intention and half randomness. And it really did devolve into something really incomprehensible. Right. Which also, um, if you're looking for you know a sort of trance state, if you can lose yourself in not thinking about what's going to happen next, but just let the sound like mm -hmm. hit you, can do that too. So this is how I think about music. <laughs> um, I've actually been going to a lot of shows that I wouldn't normally go to. Mm -hmm. um, my girlfriend likes that sort of trancey rock and roll, and mm -hmm. I've gone to shows where like, Dude, the performers have not acknowledged that there is an audience in front of them. They yeah. come out, they stare at their feet, and they play their instruments for like two hours. Mm -hmm. um, and ordinarily going to see a band where I don't know the tracks ahead of time and have some connection to the songs, like that 90-minute concert feels like five fucking hours to me. Yeah. Um, well, that's because your brain is like expanding so it can take in the new information and there's you know the discrete nuggets of mm -hmm. like this song or that song um and in a way that it doesn't happen for me when i go and watch jazz with my dad mm -hmm. um i'm able to like kind of yeah zone out and and then they leave stage and i'm like oh shit it's time for an encore that's holy fuck it's almost midnight mm -hmm. yeah and i want to say the other two bands that I think really epitomize this are like Mr. Mungle, mm -hmm. uh, especially their middle album, Disco Volante, and in particular their song, Desert Search for a Techno Ala. They really hit, they demonstrate that they know how to play just about every genre of music at the mm -hmm. drop of a hat and will change timing signatures and change moods and change everything over the course of like a nine minute song. And it goes from, like, epic, like, desert ballad to, like, weird, goofy shit and comedy. And then the other one would be Idiot Flesh, which, again, they're, like, they're all, like, Berkeley School of Music graduates, mm -hmm. but, like, have huge respect for death metal. <laughs> right. And so they do this crazy, like, death metal, but with, like, this performative aspect mm -hmm. and talk about math on their liner notes and how they want to do black math and prove that one equals zero. Nice. And that's the, how Satan does math. Mm -hmm. Just everything equals zero. <laughs> yes. And yeah, so I'll, I'll put together a playlist that'll touch on all the people that I have uh, mentioned. And that's what I want to put on as homework. Mm -hmm. yeah, listen to Zeno's yeah, music. Check it out. Um, I have always wanted Mr. Bungle to collaborate with Ween. I can see that. I, yeah, because Ween definitely will mock every genre they possibly can get their hands on. Like, they're as good as uh, Weird Al Yankovic's band yeah. in terms of just like, well, we're consummate musicians. So I don't go to a lot of shows, but I saw Ween in Seattle. I saw mm -hmm. Weird Al the last time he was through, and I'm seeing Mr. Fucking Bungle in February. We tried to get tickets, and then we tried to get <sighs> tickets for the extra shows, and there's just no tickets. I'll tell you how it goes. Yeah. I'll describe Great. it. I'll paint a picture for you. Now, come on. That someone's gonna sell a ticket. It's fine. Almost you can certainly. Get there. Um, no, yeah. I am. I am thrilled because I'm from Humboldt, and Mr. Bungle is from Eureka in mm -hmm. Humboldt. They're the only cool band to ever come out. Well, okay, there's cool bands there, but they're the only band that made it to like a national prominence. All of Pennsylvania only has Live mm. and the Bloodhound Gang. I, I love them. I oh. I, I think everyone should love the Bloodhound Gang. I do, like, too. It's an entire goddamn state. It's, it's hard to convince some people. <laughs> They're like, this is garbage. I'm like, no, wait. No, you haven't listened to it no. right yet. <laughs> Hello, his name is Jimmy Pop. <laughs> yes. No, it's funny. He's a dumb white guy. <laughs> it's great. No, he's admitting it right out front. You can just see he's, yeah, he's inviting you to hate disclaimer. him at school. <laughs> he knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I would like to take a small break and use the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bathroom's right behind you, bro. But I think I, I hit most of the things I wanted to say, and then we could maybe do like a little extra about uh, yeah, the music that uh, I made. We're at an hour. Oh, that's perfect. Um, I do yeah. want to maybe just do like my retelling of the uh, the band that I did. Mm-hmm. And we don't have to put it in this. It could be maybe an extra or something. Oh, like, yeah. I if someone wants to like, click on it because it is disturbing, but it is mm-hmm. a story that I want to share.